For Kruma Media's Polity, I'm Sane Lamini. Joining me today is award-winning sports writer Clinton van der Berg to discuss his book titled Guns and Nickels. So Clinton, reading the book was an eye-opener for me because the issue of steroids in the sports industry is not the one that many of us are familiar with. There must have been an incident, though, that has pushed you to write about this subject. Can you tell us about that? Uh, quite right. Well, in fact, it was an accumulation of incidents. However, the one that triggered the book ultimately occurred in the mid-1990s. There was a young athlete from South Africa. Her name was Lisa de Villiers. She was a track star. She was, she was young. She was 14 years old. And uh, she got busted for steroids, and she was the youngest person on earth to ever test positive for steroids. And that immediately fascinated me. I was interested. And over the years, there have been several steroids cases. And I always wondered what had become of Lisa. About two years ago, I, I reached out to try to find her. This was after having tried to find her for about 12 years through friends, acquaintances, social media, that kind of thing. And then two years ago, I picked it up again and uh, I finally got her. And she said to me, I'm ready to tell my story. And that, uh, as I say, was the trigger that uh, got the book going. It's quite a remarkable story because she was young and she had everything uh, to offer, but then her career was cut short. Yes, quite right. I mean, she was a national level sprint star, so she had won a junior national title. She was breaking records. Uh, she was very quick. She was very versatile. Um, she also, she was working with a very prominent coach. There were suspicions around him. Uh, she, she also had a father who was very pushy in the, uh, the sporting sense. You know, those trackside fathers who can be very influential, sometimes a little bit too loud. Uh, but she was, she, was, she was on the fast track to glory. Uh, she had ambitions and aspirations to go to the Olympic Games. But really, just as, she, as her career was getting going, uh, she was cut short. And, and she came back to athletics several years later, but the fire had dimmed. It was gone. Her heart wasn't in it. And um, she never reached those heights ever again. The South African athletics boss that you speak about, I think it's Banele Sindani, he made what I would say was a huge mistake at the time by hiring a Dr. Eckhard Abate, who was from Germany, who was known as the mastermind behind the doping scandals. Uh, despite being exposed in the media, they went ahead and uh, they wanted to, to work with this guy. Why do you think the media reports didn't change uh, Sindani's mind? Well, it was extraordinary. And the, the, the way he justified it, Sane, was very interesting. And he says, as South Africans, we have this great capacity for forgiveness. You know, obviously talking about our history and what have you, but he, he tried to conflate it with sport. And his view was that, yes, our mates have been guilty of some things, but we must, you know, let, let bygones be bygones and let's work with them because he's an outstanding coach. Now, there was no question he was a successful coach. But as you say, he was the mastermind of the Stasi's program with uh, sport in East Germany, which uh, amounted to tons of gold medals, but also many, many damaged athletes. Uh, it was extraordinary. And, uh, you know, the secret files, which were divulged years later, revealed some really uh, real horror stories. And what was quite interesting was that the Australians were also uh, trying to, to get him on board for, ahead of the Olympic Games. And the Australians got a whiff of his history and they, they ran a mile. They said, we are not going to appoint this guy. So in fact, what South Africa did is they pursued him. Then there was the hullabaloo in the media and they said, okay, we're not going to do this anymore. But subsequently they went and they did appoint him. And uh, unsurprisingly, it was messy. Uh, he was implicated in one athlete uh, testing positive. Uh, falsely, as it turned out, not her fault at all, but he was behind it. And certainly there were suspicions around his involvement with Castor Semenya. That's not to cast aspersions on Castor, but it was to cast aspersions on him and his involvement, which was negative and clouded in mystery. And in Chapter 11, uh, you discuss now the story of a rugby player who had the world at his feet. His name is Apiwe Janji. He tested positive as well for steroids. He was hailed as a hero. Can you now briefly tell our viewers about his story and how his world was altered? Apiri's story is remarkable because what it does is it tracks us this amazing journey of this young boy from Nobo in the Eastern Cape. And uh, he, uh, you know, he was a bit hit and miss as a rugby player and he used to flit about the back line. He clearly had some talent. 
he used to go to the shop and, and buy the bread and play rugby with the, with the bread as, as the ball. So he, he obviously had this ball sense and this great energy about it. And uh, he had some older brothers. The brothers moved to Joburg and then him, the youngster, he followed them to Joburg. He got included in the University of Joburg's rugby team. And uh, he obviously had talent, but he was a little bit misguided and misdirected. And then a, another former rugby player named Mac Messina took him under his wing and Mac said, listen, let's sort you out. You've got great talent, you know, we're going to fix you up. And before long, he was in the Lions team. He was playing wing and he had incredible pace. I mean, he was really quick. That automatically will put you, you know, ahead of 90% of rugby players, but he also had a great instinct for scoring tries. And so he was, was playing for the Lions. Uh, he did very well. He was outstanding. Uh, and he was definitely one of the coming players in South African rugby. And you know, a year later, he was in the Springbok squad. And, you know, people might have thought, oh, it's a bit soon, let's see. But he just he came right in. He looked absolutely natural there. He settled in nicely and was very successful, scored a lot of tries, a lot of pace. He had that sort of trademark uh, sign of his when he scored tries. He was exciting. He, he really was a, a nice new talent. And then he played several games for the Springbok. And he was so impressive that the year before the World Cup, uh, world Rugby named him the Young Player of the Year. So this is across the world game. So he was he was considered the best young player in the world, which is a, a heck of a of an honour. It really is. And then leading up to the World Cup, he was uh, he was pulled into the Springbok squad, and they would have camps and what have you, Pretoria, and he was pulled aside for testing. And uh, lo and behold, he tested positive. It was absolutely calamitous. He was called out to a meeting at Ellis Park with the chief executive of the Lions, Red Australia, said, you know, broke the news to him. Apiri was shocked. He, he just couldn't believe this. Um, and the incredible thing was that it wasn't a single steroid. It was a cocktail of steroids. Yeah. So several steroids had been taken. Apiri, of course, denied, denied, denied. And, you know, it was, it was no good. He was injured at the time. So he was coming through a little bit of rehabilitation there. So for some... The suspicion was that he might have been using steroids to help his recovery because apart from improving performance, you know, steroids can also assist with, with recovery and speeding it up. So there was a view that this might have happened. The week of the World Cup announcement, the World Cup squad announcement, so this was the squad that would be going to Japan to, to compete uh, for the World Cup. Um, SA Rugby got word of this positive test. So it kind of soured the announcement a little bit. Uh, whether or not Apiru would have made the squad is is probably moot because he was injured, but there was a view that he might go into the World Cup and play towards the end. He was so valuable a player, but of course they couldn't do so. That was Apiru. He got banned. He got kicked to touch. And it was it was a massive come down. It really was, uh, was extraordinary. He, of course, he contested it. He fought it. Then there was a delay because of the pandemic. There was a delay in tests and delay in follow-up, delay in legal proceedings, all that kind of thing. But... Ultimately, it, it, he was out the game. He wasn't competing, he was nowhere, and he went to ground. So Apiwe never spoke publicly, anything like that. Occasionally, he'd pop up in sort of little gyms and there'd be reports that Apiwe had been spotted working out, training, this kind of thing. And then, and it was quite sad because a couple of months after that, um, he suffered a mental breakdown. There was an episode where he was hospitalized. So he was clearly struggling, struggling to deal with all this. You could just imagine these incredible heights as a, as a superstar sportsman, and then you, you know, your world comes crashing down. You, you're not earning money anymore. Um, all those kinds of challenges. You know, so Apiru has been out the game, uh, but in recent weeks, there have been reports that he's starting training again, um, you know, trying to make his way back. I mean, if you think since 2019, a few years have passed since, and he's in fact, he's moved to Durban. So the speculation is that the Sharks uh, will take him up. And in fact, the Sharks are very interesting because they have a habit of uh, picking up players who'd be bust for steroids. You know, you think of uh, Chile boy Ralapele, uh, who in fact got caught for the, uh, for the third and final time at the Sharks, and uh, he, he got banned for uh, a good chunk of time. And then a current player on their books, Gerbrand Krobner, also set out time for steroids. So um, they, they, they clearly take quite a, a liberal attitude to, to players who've tested positive. Um, but hopefully, a uh, has learned from his mistakes and he, he can make it back. Given the cases you've shared in the book and how this has affected the athletes, are there lessons to be learned? The most obvious lesson is, is not to be so stupid because the one thing that really links all these, all these cases and all these athletes is desperation. Okay? But in very few, very well, almost none of the cases is, is there a happy ending. 
Um, so while you might win a medal or you might attain some success off the back of using steroids, uh, ultimately you're probably going to get caught. You're going to get known as a cheat. And reputationally, it's something you never get back. You can go and you can Google someone who had a positive test 20 years ago. And his name pops up and it's linked to the steroids. So there's, there's, there's very little benefit either in the, the medium term or the long term. Short term, sure, there's a bit of benefit. But uh, over and over again, it's proven that it is absolutely damaging. So when a Piwe Janji comes back, and you know, he might make the spring box. Yeah, I like him under that. He was a spring box, he tested, he got tested positive for steroids, he had a ban, he came back and he played. But whatever a Piwe does from year on in, he'll be known as a former user of steroids. So Clinton, you say there's an occurring threat in our country for the athletes to naively mix their powders and pills and in the end, bleed shock when they test for steroids. You say the athletes are responsible for whatever is in their body. Now tell us about the conversation you've also had with uh, the founder of Sparta Pharmaceuticals, Chris William, who also said 99% of the time, the supplements are not at fault. In many, many instances, uh, historically, both overseas and locally, athletes test positive and they turn around and say, my supplements, my supplements contained a uh, banned substance. How could I tell? It was tainted. Okay. In fact, some, sometimes it is true, but sometimes they go away, they have batches tested. They don't come pop up with, a, with any steroids or anything like that. The big problem with the supplement industry is that it's unregulated. So, you know, you can manufacture stuff in your, in your backyard and you can put in whatever rubbish you like and you can sell it with a fancy label and people can buy it. And of course, they can, they can potentially test positive. Now, Chris is a guy who started a company and, uh, which, which uh, manufactures supplements. And so he, of course, his business or his, his industry, what he's, his interests are in defending that industry. Um, so he says, no, no, it's, no, it's, uh, it's not the supplements. And I think it's also been proven that it's a convenient scapegoat for athletes because the one thing that using steroids and being exposed to steroids does, it leads to enormous embarrassment. So if you have an excuse, you say, no, but I use this, this supplement, okay? It's plausible. Is it possible? Yes. Is it plausible? Yes. Is it likely? Well, sometimes. Okay, but certainly it's, a, it's an excuse some athletes have used, but it doesn't always hold up to scrutiny and it doesn't always hold up to the science, but as excuses go, it's a it's a it's a very easy one. It's uh, readily available and it is plausible. So you know, some of your mates might believe it, but most of the experts, doctors, and scientists out there do not believe it. You also believe that players have two options when they test positive. You've shared the story of Dell, who has now become an anti-doping uh, campaigner. Do you think that having people like him? is helping athletes to make wise decisions. Yes, I think so. So where those athletes are important is that they are senior players. Uh, a lot of them have shifted out the game. They've retired. And you've got young players who are very impressionable. Young players who really want to, you know, they, they want to do well. They want to make an impression. They want to earn a contract. They, they want to play for their province. And ultimately, they, they want to become Springboks. So if you have an intervention along the way, somebody says, yes, you're tempted. Your coach says you've got to get big. You know, your, your school says you've got to get bigger. Uh, the temptation there is to take something that'll, that'll boost your, your chances, um, obviously physically uh, have, an, have an impact on your body. But if you have somebody like a college or father who comes in and says, no, 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 listen, you've got to think about this. Uh, because a guy like him, he's got perspective. He can look back and he says, that's the dumbest decision I ever made. You know, his concern was he'd been injured, he wasn't strong enough at that level, those kind of things. And he looks back now and he just says it wasn't with him. It was absolutely stupid. Uh, so the Sharks, to their credit, use him. They have him there. And, and I think kids especially, they, they can they connect with the guy because he was a guy who played international rugby. He played for the Sharks. You know, he was a, he was a boinky, he was a hero. Um, and so if you can hear it from the horse's mouth, so to speak, I think it can be helpful. And it offers a cautionary tale to youngsters. Uh, who ought to hear from, uh, from people like Carla. And lastly, Clinton, what else do you hope the readers will take from your book? Well, for me, when I wrote the book, I, I had sort of black and white views around uh, the issue of doping. Uh, but increasingly, I discovered there is a gray area in the middle. But the, the one thing that came out is how desperately sad all these stories are. And they end up with just broken dreams. 
All these athletes have wanted to just win. They want success. Um, they want that medal. Uh, you know, they, they want to. They want to be able to have something to show off for all the hours of sweat they put in, and they take steroids, and it just it just ends up in a sorry heap. It's a, it's a, it's a complete mess. So I I hope that this this offers huge caution not only to the participants but I think to parents as well who uh, hear these horror stories and uh, often quite uh, frightened about it and just to show them that it is never worth it. That was Clinton van der Berg in conversation with Polity about his book titled Guns and Necklaces.